Fusarium head blight costs Alberta producers between $3 million and $8.7 million each year. These losses are primarily due to yield loss and downgrading. The large difference between $3 million and $8.7 million per year is because the fusarium situation is never exactly the same one year to the next. It will depend on a number of things like the cultivars of wheat that are grown, whether they're more tolerant to fusarium or whether they're more susceptible. In addition, the environment and weather conditions will play a role in how much disease pressure exists. And finally, it'll depend on the commodity price. The more valuable the wheat, the greater the loss. In this presentation, we'll talk about fusarium head blight and discuss what is it, why should I care about it, and what can be done to manage it. So what is fusarium head blight? Fusarium head blight is a disease of small grain cereals that's caused by the fungus fusarium. There are four species of fusarium that can cause fusarium head blight in North America, namely Fusarium graminiarum, Fusarium culmorum, Fusarium avenaceum, and Fusarium cruquilens. Fusarium graminiarum is by far the most important cause of Fusarium head blight in Western Canada. This is because Fusarium graminiarum is the most aggressive of the species of Fusarium. So it causes more head blight than the others. And in addition to that, it produces large numbers of mycotoxins or poisonous compounds that can accumulate in the head and in the grain, making it one of the most damaging pathogens of cereal crops. The main mycotoxin that's produced by Fusarium graminiarum is called deoxynivalenol, which is abbreviated D-O-N or DON. This mycotoxin is also called vomitoxin. Here we see on the left some healthy, plump wheat kernels. On the right, we see wheat kernels that have been infected with the fusarium fungus and as a result are shrunken, pale, and kind of have a chalky appearance. These are called fusarium damaged kernels, or FDKs. They're also called tombstone kernels. Fusarium graminiarum is classified as a pest in Alberta. Since 1999, Fusarium graminiarum has been a pest listed under the regulations of Alberta's Agricultural Pests Act. And in Section 22C, it says that no person shall, for propagation purposes, acquire, sell, distribute, or use any seed, root, or tuber, or other material containing a pest. This means that if grain is infected with Fusarium, it should not be used as seed. In addition, a number of other uh, control regulations are specified in the Act and the regulations that indicate what's to be done about this pest. Landowners and occupants have certain responsibilities to prevent the entry and spread of pests and destroy them if they're found. Local authorities in each municipality are responsible for enforcing pest control measures, which are listed in the Fusarium Management Plan. And confirmation of Fusarium graminiarum could result in a notice to control or a control notice issued by the local authority. In the case of non-compliance, the act gives the inspector authority to destroy a crop or harvested grain. So where did Fusarium graminiarum come from? Fusarium graminiarum first showed up in eastern Canada in the early 1900s. The first report was in 1919. The disease moved west and there were reports on corn and cereals in the 20s and the 40s. In the 80s and 90s though, this is when the outbreaks really began to be severe and specifically in Manitoba in 1993, there was a severe losses due to Fusarium graminiarum in Manitoba and the disease spread rapidly so that in a matter of a year or two, the situation totally changed. Now in Alberta, being the furthest west of the Prairie Provinces, we've had the luxury of kind of watching it move more slowly since the Manitoba situation and slowly make its way west uh, into our province. And in 1989, it was confirmed that Fusarium graminiarum was present in southern Alberta. This map 
shows the 2013 results from the Canadian Grain Commission for concentrations of the mycotoxin deoxynivalenol or DON. And you can see that the heaviest concentrations are in the crop districts in the south. And so in irrigated southern Alberta, this is where we most frequently find Fusarium graminiarum. Over the period of from 2001 to 2013, however, the pathogen has been found with increasing frequency in other areas outside of irrigated southern Alberta. So we have reason to believe that the situation is changing. Further to this, the most recent Fusarium head blight survey in Alberta was done in 2010. And in that year, Fusarium griniarum was confirmed to be found in all of the red municipalities shown on this map. So in southern Alberta, Fusarium griniarum was relatively common in southern Alberta. You can see there were a few other municipalities that also were positive. These other positives in central and more northern Alberta were very, very low incidence. And when we went back to those counties the following year, we didn't find Fusarium griniarum. So in central Alberta up until 2010, it was not commonly found. It would sometimes flare up but then disappear. In southern Alberta, however, it was commonly found and we would routinely find evidence for griniarum in those regions. One of the things that leads us to believe the situation is changing and that is becoming more common in central and northern Alberta is shown in this map. This map was provided by 2020 Seed Labs in 2014 and it shows the percent positive samples for Fusarium griniarum that were tested. So seed samples that tested positive for griniarum and the darker the red, the more percent positives for griniarum there were. And you can see that there are a number of counties that previously would have shown up white, being Fusarium griniarum free, now are showing either low levels or even in some cases high levels of Fusarium griniarum. So how does Fusarium griniarum spread? How would it make its way from southern Alberta to central Alberta or how would it make its way from Saskatchewan into Alberta? The fungus produces spores. It produces airborne spores on cereal stubble and it also produces spores that can be dispersed by rain splash. So in rainy conditions, the spores can be splashed small distances throughout a field. And in windy weather, when spores are discharged, they can get up into the, above the boundary layer and into wind currents and they can spread from field to field. So this pathogen has the mechanisms that it can disperse within a field and from field to field. Finally, grain, harvested grain that's used for seed can also contain the pathogen. So if seed is transported long distances, the pathogen can follow with it. Hence the reason that we should avoid using grain for seed that's infected with fusarium. This slide shows the disease triangle for all pathogens, including fusarium griniarum. And what it means is that in order for disease to occur, three things have to align. The first is there has to be a virulent pathogen. So Fusarium griniarum is certainly that. The second you have to have is a susceptible host or a susceptible wheat or barley or oat crop. And the third is a conducive environment. And for Fusarium head blight, this would be warm, wet conditions during anthesis of the crop. And when these three things align, Fusarium head blight can result. The reason we should care about this is that when these three things align, it can cause significant economic losses, both for grain yield, grain quality, and market acceptability. The Canadian Grain Commission has strict fusarium damaged kernel threshold levels that are, uh, must be met to receive the top cereal grades. If we don't get those grades, we get a lost there's lost revenue. Second, when the weather's conducive, this can drive fusarium head blight disease pressure to higher and higher levels. So in years where we have warm, moist conditions, during the period of time that the cereal crop is flowering, we can often see elevated levels of fusarium damaged kernels. As previously mentioned, losses in Canada have ranged from 50 million to 300 million annually since the 90s. 
and an estimated cost of Al to Alberta farmers in 2009 was 3.6 million, and in 2010, 8.7 million. In 2012, the estimated loss was 2.9 million. One of the reasons that we want to prevent Fusarium from spreading is that once it becomes established or commonly found in an area, it's very difficult to control. The best method for managing this disease is to avoid getting it. There are no completely resistant varieties. There are varieties that are more tolerant, but none that are completely resistant. In addition to that, there are no fungicides registered to control, only to suppress disease. And third, it's very difficult to predict when chemical controls are needed because the disease is very weather dependent and the chemicals must be sprayed on a risk estimate basis rather than appearance of symptoms. So the fungicides need to be applied before you see any symptoms. And finally, the window for successful chemical management is extremely small, only 10 days, making it very difficult sometimes to get protective fungicides on where they're needed at the right time. It was mentioned that Fusarium infection causes the accumulation of mycotoxins in the grain. When mycotoxins accumulate in harvested grain, it can sometimes make the product unsuitable for certain markets. For example, we don't want mycotoxins in our bread, and so it affects the baking and milling quality of wheat. Uh, not just on the human health side, but also the mycotoxin affects the ability of yeast to make the bread rise, and so it, it actually affects the quality of the dough and the wheat. Brewers don't want barley with deoxynivalenol because it causes a phenomenon known as gushing in beer, so that when you open a bottle of beer, half of it ends up on the floor. From a quality perspective, this is not acceptable. It also can affect the flavors and alcohol content of beer, and so it's just simply not acceptable for malting. So what can we do with grain that has high levels of mycotoxins? Can we feed it to animals? Uh, not always. So if certain monogastric livestock like hogs eat mycotoxin contaminated feed, it can cause them to get very sick, cause them to grow less, cause them to have birth defects. So in this photograph, you can see the hog on the right was fed grain with zero parts per million of deoxynivalenol, and the hog on the left, or in the foreground, was fed five parts per million. So you can see there was significant feed refusal and um, lack of weight gain in that animal. One Alberta producer said, our input costs have increased by about 20 to $40 per acre because of Fusarium graminiarum. We've had some downgrading from time to time. In all, in a given year, depending on the weather, Fusarium impact is probably $10 to $50 per acre, significantly affecting our yield and profitability. It's important to avoid the idea that Fusarium graminiarum isn't here and that we don't need to manage it. There was a period of time in Alberta when Fusarium wasn't a problem. There was a period of time where Fusarium graminiarum was only a problem in the south. Alberta's now reached a time where everyone needs to be aware of and prepared to manage Fusarium head blight. Don't assume that it won't affect you. So what can be done about Fusarium graminiarum? We're going to go through some things that can be done to manage Fusarium graminiarum through each season of the year, and we'll start with winter. So first of all, uh, after harvest, don't store feed grain in uncovered piles or in contact with the soil. It's important to clean up uh, sites where grain uh, made contact with the soil. The reason for this is that Uncovered grain in contact with the soil will allow fusarium to grow and mycotoxins to accumulate. And if grain with lots of mycotoxin is fed, uh, it can result in some serious problems for livestock. The winter is also a good time to work out your crop rotation. When, crops, when cereal crops are rotated with pulses and oil seeds, it helps to uh, avoid serious fusarium issues. 
Another thing to consider is avoiding crops. So if you're in an area where you're at a high risk for Fusarium gruiniarum, you may want to consider crops that are uh, highly susceptible to gruiniarum. You may want to consider keeping them out of your rotation for a significant period. So this would be things like corn and durum wheat. These are the most susceptible hosts for gruiniarum. The second thing to consider that you may want to plan out in the winter is to stagger your planting dates for cereals. The reason to do this is that if all of your cereal crops come into flower at the same time, then they all, and they all need a fungicide, and your window's only 10 days, it could be very challenging to get your fungicides on. In addition to that, if there's only a one week period during anthesis that the weather is conducive, and only half of your crop is in flower during that week, then you've just avoided Fusarium gruiniarum on half your farm. So staggering planting dates can help spread out your risk across the season rather than having it all at one time. Field location can be another important consideration as Fusarium can move from one field to the next. So if practical, you can avoid planting wheat, barley, etc. immediately adjacent to high-risk fields. So if there are high-risk fields, such as fields where there's been a lot of corn production, where there are high levels of gruminiarum expected, you can avoid planting small grain cereals adjacent to those. We're going to move now into the springtime. One of the ways that you can help manage fusarium is to reduce the buildup of infested crop residues by rotating away from cereals to non-host crops for at least three years and making sure that corn which is a major disease host, is avoided in the rotation. So what can be done at seeding to help avoid Fusarium gruiniarum? Well, during the winter time, you can select varieties that have the best Fusarium head blight tolerance. And so consulting fact sheets like the varieties of cereals and oilseeds crops for Alberta will help you understand which varieties have the best tolerance to Fusarium head blight and incorporating them in your high-risk situations. Using disease-free seed is also an important management recommendation. You may want to consider winter wheat varieties that flower prior to Fusarium head blight spores developing, so incorporating winter wheat into your rotation. When you use disease-free seed, it's important that you have a certificate from a certified seed lab speci showing specifically that it's fusarium free before you plant it and then keep those certificates in your records to make sure that you can verify that that's been done. Another management recommendation is to treat cereal seed with a registered fungicide that has fusarium on the label prior to planting. Seed treatments won't eradicate fusarium gruniarum from a seed lot, but it will help to prevent it from being transferred from one field to the other, and it will also help reduce um, seedling blight. So it will help with stand establishment and, and help to improve your yields in cases where there might be some issues. The second thing you can do at seeding is to increase your seeding rate. Increasing seeding rates promote a uniform stand and reduce the amount of tillering. As a result, there's a shorter flowering window for the crop. This is important in situations where you may need to apply a fungicide or when you want to minimize the period of time that your crop is at risk. In the summertime, in areas where irrigation is available, it's important to avoid or limit irrigation during the flowering period. And the way to do that is to saturate your soil profile five to 10 days prior to flowering and then avoid irrigating or creating humid conditions during the period where the crop is flowering. One Alberta farmer says, we are starting to watch the weather more closely for timing our fungicide applications. We've realized that fusarium is now a long-term reality, but if we use good agronomic practices and careful irrigation management, we'll be okay. Now, in fields where there's a high risk for Fusarium gruiniarum, or in areas where Fusarium gruiniarum is commonly found, it's important to consider a fungicide application before the symptoms appear and when the crop is coming into anthesis. 
In order to decide and make spray decisions, Sask Wheat has a good decision-making tool on their website. The situation between South Irrigation Districts and other parts of the province might be different, but the management tools are the same for across the province. So how do we know when to spray? Fungicides must be applied before the fusarium spores come in contact with the wheat heads, and specifically with the anthers or the flowers. The fungicides provide suppression only and may not reduce yield loss, but may reduce mycotoxin levels. The application at early heading or growth stage 37 is the appropriate time. Day zero to start spraying is when 75% of the wheat heads are on the main stems are fully emerged and the window closes when the anthers are extruded and begin to turn white and dry. When determining risk factors to make spray decisions, some of the following things should be considered. The first is, is fusarium commonly found in my area? Are there adjacent fields that put me at a high risk for fusarium gariniarum? So for example, is there durum wheat or corn nearby or in my crop rotation? Are the weather conditions predicted to be damp and warm during the flowering stage? What are my irrigation practices during the flowering stage? And finally, is the yield potential good for this field and are cereal grain prices high? There are no options for two applications for Fusarium griniarum management. And this is because the window for fungicide application is short, only about 10 days. Dr. Tom Wolf provided some suggestions for correct sprayer nozzle adjustment. Dr. Wolf recommends that nozzles should be angled forward or the use of double nozzles that spray in both directions should be used. The greater the angle of the nozzle, the better for control or suppression of fusarium head blight. Dr. Wolf also recommends to use coarse sprays to maintain low boom heights and apply fungicides at slower speeds is always recommended especially if the spray needs to go deep into the canopy. And finally, maintain 10 to 20 gallons per acre for fungicide applications. After the crop has come out of anthesis, and probably during the late milk to early dough stage, this is the time that we can scout for evidence of the disease. So even though it's really at this stage too late to do anything about it, this is the period of time where we can determine if our management practices have been successful. This is the time to scout. And what you'll notice first is that the majority of the head will be green, but spikelets that have Fusarium griminiarum on them will prematurely ripen or turn yellow. And so when you see individual spikelets turning yellow before the rest of the head, this is an indication that Fusarium griminiarum is causing head blight in your field. Here's an example. You can see the green spikelets above and below, and then the one in the center is turning yellow. And in this case, you can actually see the pink discoloration peeking out from under the glooms. That pink discoloration is actually a sign of the fungus. That pink color is the fungus, Fusarium griniarum, growing under the glooms and causing head blight. Now, there are also some management recommendations for harvest. In the harvested grain, especially wheat, you can actually see the difference between the, the plump, uninfested kernels and the shrunken, uh, discolored or bleached tombstone kernels, which result in downgrading. This fusarium damaged kernel is the grading factor that will lead to downgrading. So is there any way we can reduce the amount of FDKs in our harvested grain? Well, combines use air blast to separate grain from chaff. Many of those fusarium damaged kernels are small and shrunken enough that they're very light, much lighter than the sound kernels. So it is possible to blow a significant portion of the fusarium damaged kernels out of the back of the combine by increasing the wind speed or air blast above normal ranges. In work that was done at the University of Guelph in 96, a tenfold, disc, a tenfold decrease 
in fusarium damaged kernels was achieved in grain when the fan speeds were operated at maximum. The second thing to be aware of at harvest is you shouldn't try to store grain above 16% moisture. In these cases, the fusarium will continue to colonize and continue to produce mycotoxin. Another thing that can be done at harvest is to prevent moving Fusarium griniarum infested seed or residue from one field to the other. So removing any loose crop residue from the equipment, blowing out the combine before it leaves the field, and not moving grain from one field to the other uh, will help to keep Fusarium where it's at and not spread it around. Another thing that can be done is to control volunteer cereals and grassy weeds on infested lands, including headlands. As previously mentioned, it's good to make sure that infected grain doesn't come in contact with the soil. The infected seed can serve as a source of disease in later growing seasons. So infected seed has to be handled properly. If it's meant to be used for feed, it shouldn't come in contact with the soil. Again, it should be 14% moisture or lower. And it's important to check grain frequently to ensure that the grain stays in conditions that will avoid further problems with toxins or downgrading. When loading or unloading grain for feed, you may need to consider a wind fence or a drop sock to prevent grain from blowing off. A covered loading unloading facility is preferred, but a grain sock can help to minimize the amount of grain or dust that blows around, as this can spread the disease as well. Finally, when transporting grain, all modes of transport, whether it's feed grain or straw, should be securely covered to prevent spillage during transport. Trailers and grain cars that are transporting grain should be leak-proof, they should eliminate grain loss, and if, you, if on your farm you'd like to prevent Fusarium griniarum from arriving, it's important to only buy seed or straw that's been tested and found to be free of Fusarium griniarum. If grain is going to be fed to livestock, a knowledge of the mycotoxin levels is critical to determine whether the grain is suitable for feeding. Grain can be tested uh, at various labs for the presence and um, quantity of deoxynivalenol or mycotoxin. Cattle can withstand higher levels and there are uh, threshold levels for deoxynivalenol specified by the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for cattle, hogs, chickens, etc. And these should be consulted and grain tested if there's any question of whether there's mycotoxin present. So when asked the question, what did you do to try to manage fusarium head blight and minimize your losses, one Alberta pr producer said, we have to be careful when we're growing wheat in rotation with corn. We've started to be proactive with fungicides, although it doesn't always work. And because we're under irrigation, we have to make sure not to water when the crop is flowering. You can't control the weather though, and so you still get hit every so often. We control weeds and make sure that we don't have any carryover of host plants. We avoid growing durum or other susceptible varieties, and we try to incorporate more pulses into our rotation to break the cycle. How can you minimize your risk? If you're interested in learning more about how to manage risk, you can follow the best management practices that are listed in Alberta's Fusarium Griniera Management Plan. One Alberta producer says, you have to do the right things right. Good agronomic practices, good irrigation management, good genetics, and responsible use of fungicides. We have to stop fooling ourselves about fusarium by pretending it's not here. Don't see, don't tell is not a good management solution. By working together and implementing these management practices, test, treat, plant, spray, we can all help prevent and manage fusarium griminiarum.